Grace and peace be unto you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, John Wooden was the basketball coach at UL UCLA for about 30 years, and many people will argue that he was the greatest coach of all time in any sport. Uh, his uh, teams won 10 national championships, including seven in a row. Many of his players went on to play professionally and star in the NBA, people we know as like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, some of you knew as Lou Alcindor, uh, Bill Walton, and many, many others. But uh, John Wooden was a motivator and certainly a teacher. But day one, when you showed up for practice at, uh, for him, the first drill was not on the court. It was in the locker room. John Wooden showed up in the locker room. And he would show his team how they were to put their socks on and then their shoes. And, uh, you know, he would say, you, you play on a hard floor, so shoes and socks must fit right so you don't get blisters. If you get blisters, you won't focus on other things. We won't do so well. We'll lose, and I'll lose my job. So I'm going to teach you how to put your shoes and socks on right. So he would demonstrate no wrinkles around the toes or around the heels, and he would go into an in-depth explanation about that's where blisters form. And then uh, he would... Uh, so you would say, well, okay, that's fine. You'd put on your shoes and pull up the top laces. He says, no way, that's not how you do it. So you'd put, he would demonstrate that you work your way up from the very, very bottom of these Chuck Taylor Converse shoes, one eyelet at a time, tightening them, making it snug the whole way up so it's nice and even. And then you double tie the top every time. He said, this is exactly how I want it done. And I am sure there were some who rolled their eyes, saying, what have I gotten myself into by going here? But Coach Wooden was setting the stage for his players so that when they, if they could focus on the little things, when they got out on the court, they would be focused on bigger, more important things. He, would teach, he was teaching them to be disciplined and focused as an individual so they could be disciplined, a disciplined team. And he was known that on the, fun, uh, on the court, he would just teach fundamentals day in and day out, over and over and over again. A two-handed balance pass, always. You catch with two hands, always. You always sprint up the court. He would show them how to play defense. He would ultimately say his vision was always that they would simply play fundamental basketball in practice and in every game. And if they did that, they didn't have to worry or pay any attention to the other team if they played by the fundamentals, they would be successful and carry that into their life. Fundamentals are the things that are of central, important, central importance. They are characteristics and behaviors in life that are to be repeated over and over again so that they can become habits, become part of us. You know, as I said, Tuesday is an important day in Montgomery County. I know some, some counties are already back to school, but it is the first day of school. Uh, I, I counted, we have at least 30 teachers in the, in the congregation, and I know many of you are retired teachers. But uh, I know Tuesday there's going to be a lot of teaching of fundamentals. Right? Am I right, Peter? Some, some fundamentals will be taught. This is how we are going to behave. This is what I expect in the classroom, or if you're elementary school, the lunchroom, or how you're to behave on the bus. This is what you're going to do for homework. This is what, what we need to see. Uh, but it's about how we are to behave. Uh, I'm sure one of Peter's expectations, if I, if I remember right from him, is that when the bell rings, they're all standing in place ready to sing, not chit-chatting. He can correct me later. <laughs> but I know he's a person of expectation. You know, the first reading, uh, St. Paul, is a wonderful, wonderful passage. St. Paul was writing to the Christian community in Rome, to this group of people he'd not yet met. He had affection for them, he had heard good things about them, and now what he's doing is setting out to teach them some of the fundamentals about how to live as Christians, as followers of Jesus in this world, to how to be the church, if you will. And we know that in every generation, to be a Christian is way more than just saying you believe in Jesus. It's about letting that belief transform the way you live, how you're how it informs your daily behaviors. 
So this Romans 12, which Janelle read, is kind of the high water mark, forgive the reference, the high water mark, it's a gem. It's the finest vision of what Christian community is and can be. Marva Dawn says, if the Christian community could actually live out Romans chapter 12, we, the church, would experience joy beyond all belief. The world around us would be dramatically altered, and many, many people would look at us and say, I absolutely want what those people have. Um, and what we have is Jesus. Jesus, our leader, the one who leads the way, who calls each of us beloved for who we are, who calls us to treat the people of this world as beloved, even if they do not seem to deserve it at times. I think Romans 12, I would encourage you to, to cut that out of the bulletin today, stick it on your refrigerator. When you're hungry for something, go and look at it and read it, and remind yourself that that really is a vision of what the world hungers for. You know, there, there's a lot of, there's like 30 imperative statements in that, so I don't plan to make this a 30-point sermon. <laughs> read it on your own. There's going to be bits and pieces of it that stand out for you today, and something will stand out different. Uh, I, I just want to reinforce three of them today that I think are fundamental, or at least stuck in my mind today. Uh, Paul says in English, bless those who persecute you. And on the surface, I do not consider myself a person who is persecuted one bit. Most of us don't. But digging in, uh, when you kind of look at the Greek and sort, sort of play around with the language a bit, a bit, Paul says, bless those people in the world whose actions at this moment in time are despicable. They're harassing others, they're mistreating others, they're hostile, or they're simply acting uncaring toward other people. And when you broaden that definition, you realize, boy, that might include me at times. It might include you at times. But it's a challenge. It's blessing that is a hard thing. The word bless means consecrate something with our prayers. It's, it's praying that God would, God, please use this person for, God, for your purpose. Please use this despicable person for your purpose. And when we pray that, you're realizing what you're praying for is change. But, but we, we're natural, it's, we're, it's right for us to do that because the church is always in the business of changing lives, letting the gospel transform the people around us. It's a, it's a piece of cake. It is so easy to curse the people of this world whose actions are despicable at this moment in time. But I would say cursing does really not bring about any transformation. It might raise awareness of a problem, but I don't think it ultimately changes hearts and minds. F fundamentally, I think what Paul is saying is keep praying. You, people of God, keep praying for changed lives. Never, ever stop believing that change is possible. And I think what he's saying by, by praying for people who are really we don't like He's saying, you're, by doing that, you're keeping your heart open to welcoming them at some point in a, in a dramatic way. Paul would know. Paul would know because he himself at one point had been a despicable person, a vengeful, violent person who really I wouldn't have wanted to be around, but, but a guy named Barnabas welcomed him in and, and vouched for him, and, and others in turn said, I like Barnabas. If Barnabas says that, maybe I should give Paul a chance as well. Uh, our council president, Bill Similink, is in Rwanda right now. And Bill called me on the phone the other day. I was surprised to hear from him. Uh, he'd been on a tour, and I could tell, I could tell something profound had happened to him. He, he got to talking about how uh, in, in Rwanda there was a mass genocide in 1994 where the uh, majority Hutu population set out to eliminate the uh, Tutsi minority. It's horrific. It was despicable. And Bill was at this small gathering of people, and he said front and center was this woman uh, wearing a Washington Nationals t-shirt. <laughs> and I'm sitting here hearing him tell that story saying God's up to something here. But uh, she, she was a Tutsi. She went on to say about how several members of her family were killed in the genocide. And sitting next to her was this big man, a Hutu, who uh, he said, I, I, I was in jail for eight years for killing people in the genocide. And uh, 
her people. And uh, the two were sitting right next to each other. The woman said out loud, I have forgiven him. I have forgiven many, many people, and I have been praying for these people for a long, long time. And uh, they both went on to say, we are no longer Hutus. We are no longer Tutsis. She said, those we don't use those terms anymore. They're irrelevant. She said, we call ourselves now Rwandis. Rwandis, that's who we are, all of us together. All of us together. And Bill's, Bill's describing this to me, and, and there's no doubt in my mind, this is a a holy, he, he had experienced holy ground, holy ground where reconciliation and radical change had occurred, and it was certainly an act of God. Uh, going, going on a little bit further, going on to another fundamental, Paul lifts this up, contribute to the needs of the saints. In Greek it says, make yourself a sharer of necessities. Paul was reminding us that Christian fellowship in every generation includes generosity and the tangible sharing of resources, not just a select group of people doing that. As Christians, we all do that. That's what he's saying. It's central to our identity. It's central to our joy. It's central to the way we care for the world. And I always think when, when we give, the people of God, when we give, what we're doing is we're projecting our faith. We're projecting our love. We're projecting our hope into the future. And all week, one of the most inspiring things for me is that we've got call after call and email after email, people saying, how can I help the hurricane, the people who have been impacted by Hurricane Harvey? How can I tell other people to give? And we uh, gladly shared that message of how they can give. But what, what stood out for me is there was not one person I've encountered along the way who asked about race, political affiliation, or religion, they just simply saw people in need and said, I want to help. Lutheran disaster response we know is gonna be in it for the long haul, long before it's at the top of our mind anymore. And you should give thanks for that, that Lutherans will be generous for a long time to come. Lastly, thank you for hanging in with me. A Little longer than normal, but one of the things Paul says is, extend hospitality to strangers. Philozenia, which means love of strangers, means pursue new people and include them in the fellowship you share. St. Paul is saying it is better, we are better together when we welcome new people into our midst. One of the images you're going to hear throughout the fall, one of the things I want you to picture is picture yourself as a Lego. Everyone picture a Lego? Legos are the coolest toy on the planet, I think. There are uh, different colors, different colors, different sizes, but uh, you can arrange them and rearrange them in creative ways. It's a fun thing to do for adults and kids alike. Each piece, though, has the ability to connect. Every single piece has the ability to connect to others. And the coolest thing I learned along the way that I will never, ever forget is the oldest Lego I forget what year it was, the oldest Lego that was ever created can absolutely fit with a Lego that was just made five minutes ago. And it will fit the ones that are made next year and the year after that. What that says to me is the people of God, you and I, charter member, the one who just walked in the door today, we're meant to be together, we're stronger together. And we bless each other and bless the world with this witness of, of generosity and hope and peace that we project into this community. Romans 12, there's a lot more than what I've said. Read it and study it and make that part of who you are fundamentally. Amen.